Why, hello, Kurt. Good morning. I, I can't tip you with my coffee because uh, my Keurig is still unhappy, although I found out what's wrong with it, so I can fix it. I was wondering if it was going to be okay. It's it's a serious problem when you're, when you, you know, I have to go back to the coffee pot thing. You know, I have one wow. of those fancy wow. little coffee pots that makes like four cups or whatever it is in two minutes, but that's like really archaic. By it's like work. Standards. Yeah, that's good. You better clean up the browns and stuff. You know? Oh, crazy, Bill. But anyway, so uh, I can't tip you my coffee this morning, so I'll have to just cheers. With the um, I was able to make mine work. Makes sense. It leaked all over my counter, water everywhere. Um, right? I need a wife. Huh. Anyway, or a housekeeper, one or the other. Anyway. Probably a housekeeper. Wives are too difficult. Anyway, um, so you were about to go off on uh, saying you were. I asked I was, where your head is. You know where your where your mind is at the moment, and you were about to say something. That's very interesting. It's like the um, it's the I was watching videos last night. I became it was a very dark moment because it's like this is just uh, the situation is dire. It's becoming aware of the uh, full nature of the forces arrayed against us and the uh, patterns that they've implemented to uh, achieve their victory, which is at our expense. And it's a systematic methodology that has it is, is destructive of uh, identities, specifically national identities. It's all universalist. They're, all, they're always the same. Um, and you're right, it's pretty bad, right? I mean, uh, and, and this is why one of the things I've been thinking about, because I had the same idea that you did at the same time last night, which is that, you know, this is why zero, to this is why the problem is a conflict between itrar functionalism, which causes us to be tolerant, and the need for intolerance. Because incrementalism is extremely effective against um, uh, um, trifunctional society, as trifunctional society, which is of mess, of it tends to be has to be tolerant because of competition between the elites. So, you know, it's I, I just uh, I get to the point where I'm like I don't know if we can do this because um, we had the population in 2016, but I don't know if we have the population. Don't know. I, I certainly see a bunch of very mad people. Um, I don't see a government powerful enough to do anything about it. Um, but unless the body of mad people get up and do something together that is larger than the government can do something about, They'll keep doing what they do, which is uh, incrementalism. And they'll, uh, what's that, go the game where you pop the gopher when it sticks its heads up? Whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. So they'll keep using whack-a-mole to take out everybody who tries to become a leader. Right. And so you have, uh, and we can't, and, and the, the people who, the whack-a-moles that come out and turn into shooters and stuff, they're not actually helpful. Um, no, that's negative action. That, that's negative action. So. What we have to do, of course, is show up, you know, a couple million strong and pretty hard to do that when one of the primary reason why a lot of these people are this uh, disenfranchised and unhappy is because the economic duress that they're under. While they're still trying to be res demonstrate that they're masculine by having responsibility in families and they can't do it under the economic duress they're under. So it's like, well, how do you get, you know, it's one thing to pull a bunch of people where George Soros can hire a bunch of buses and take a bunch of criminals and drug addicts and prostitutes to, a, 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 which is really, you're talking about the people who are professional protesters on the left, they're, they're dysfunctional, not healthy, they're unhealthy people. <clears throat> uh, they're, they're essentially petty, petty criminals or petty social criminals, right? They're, they're, and so Zor Soros can pay somebody some limited amount of money, and there's always a bunch of people willing to get on that. 
but you take responsible people and they they won't do something unless they have fairly high confidence and, and if they have the money to do it and there's nobody to fund them. So it's just, it's really, I mean, I, we had people come to my thing that uh, they, they took them quite a while to pay off the credit cards it took to come to the the, the event. So I, I, it was pretty hard. I understand the difficulty, but we're going to have to pay that difficulty or we're going to have to pay the price for not paying for that difficulty. It's just going to have to happen. There's no avoiding the cost. There's a cost here. This unavoidable. The other thing is they want too much certainty. And that's like, a, that, that just means you're weak. Um, you, there is no certainty in these things. There's only try as hard as you can and never give up. I mean, if you if you want to go there and wave a flag and go home and eat Snickers bars, it's not going to play your video games the next day. You're not going to get anything out of it. You're just going to continue to be um, oppressed and eventually victimized. So it's just not going to happen. The other thing was related to um, um, James Lindsay's work. Um, this uh, he talked about this premise called entryism, entryism which is you 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 the enemy stuffs the uh institution of targeted institution they start loading it with people who are ideologically acceptable to their or ideologically it's already i mean right and, but and, then they then they control the gates that allow the new recruits to come into that institution and then they They've transformed that institution into a uh, producer of, or yeah, an a ideologically motivated institution. Mm -hmm. And they change the definitions as they go to control the um, apparatus where diversity used to mean something that was useful. And it becomes something that is absolutely not useful and discriminatory in its function. So, so it's that that it is. It's just like okay, it's just a rough situation we find ourselves in because the uh, success of this parasitic group has been so great, very quiet. Well, I mean, they did the same thing. The Christians did the same thing to Rome. They started out with the fringe. Act, which they call what we call uh, organizing today, and they uh, got all the dysfunctionals, and then they got the women, and then they got the betas who wanted to interact with the women, and then which was large enough, it became interesting for men of competence to take power by managing these people, and they went over and took the Roman institutions and they destroyed. The martial masculine re, uh, rational empirical nature of Rome and they replaced it with this feminine um, uh, superstitious uh, obedience hierarchy of uh, the church and uh, of course that's you know whether we know that's one of the reasons that caused the fall of the Roman Empire but it's more important that it caused the failure of the restoration of the Roman Empire and so we, it took us really till the Vikings came back in and restored martial ethic to Northern Europe to recover from it. And it took the restoration of the Mediterranean trade in the North Sea Baltics to recreate the uh, entrepreneurial culture uh, without, in other words, the honesty of the cult necessary for that culture. Rather than the sort of corruption of the of of, of uh, Venice and Italy, and uh, then from that we got the uh, men, we got had manorialism long enough to purge the lower classes, and so we got the uh, elites of the of the northwest Europe to create the Age of Sail, you know. But I mean, once that and. The today, even today, the countries that were Christian, the long Catholic, the longest, are still the most corrupt hmm. because that that the church is a corrupting influence because it's a corrupting organization. 
So just so you can have a corrupting government, you can have a corrupting church. But it's very when you have a corrupting monarchy, they tend to get perished. Yeah. And so that's the value of the monarchy. So, you know, whether you have a secular church with an ideological basis or a supernatural church with a supernatural basis, you're still stuck with the monarchies and the rule of law being the optimum because you still have the it's possible to kill a monarchy. Um, and, and it's very, very difficult to kill a church or a, um, a bureaucracy. That's right. That's why it's important that you have the, the bureaucracy serves at the will of a monarchy. Right? That's, it's not because this guy is all powerful. It's so that you can get rid of bad people. Because organizations naturally go bad. So we think of it as, well, we're evicting the Congress and the president every so often, but we're not evicting the bureaucracies. That's right. And they're the ones with all the power. And this is the debate that we have in America over term limits. We'd like to have term limits, but if we term limit people, all that does is make the deep state bureaucracy that we can't fire. <laughs> so I don't, I think that's a, that's a, um, it used to be, that it was the winter spoil system. They would just throw them out and get new ones, and and that was the uh, spoils of the victory of uh, electoral processes. And they made that illegal with the civil service system that they we are currently engaged in. But there there really is nothing to prevent the president from breaking the law, throwing all the bombs out, and replacing them, and then um, having a court fight later. Well, there is. It's called a constitutional crisis. Um, in other words, if the president fires them all and they don't do it, he has to bring in the military. Well, he just locks them out. <clears throat> right. You have to have somebody do that. And who's going to enforce that? There you have it. So uh, the problem with constitutional crisis is everything is everything we do is based on <clears throat> respect for the division of powers. And so the minute you break, have a division of powers that is irreconcilable, you have a constitutional crisis. It doesn't just solve one problem. It takes down the whole fucking government. So, I mean, this is what one of the reasons we have. And that's very frightening to everybody. And the fact that a constitutional crisis is very frightening to everybody is the reason it doesn't happen. Well, it goes to this is like the issue comes to be, um, is it more frightening that which we face without the constitutional crisis? Well, I mean, if Trump gets elected, he says that's what he's going to do. Hmm. I think that would be the, the optimum cure for it. And it's also why he's built up this army of people that would, would go, because last time he didn't expect to win, right? So we didn't build up all these teams to come in. And so he went in with what he had, right? Um, and he went in there with the, uh, not having governed, with the expectation that the president has more power than it does. The president's pretty weak, really. Yes. Was, I mean... In internationally strong, domestically, domestically weak. weak. And there's no, um, there's no equivalent of the prime minister that can be, you know, that can do this, so... We're kind of, there's no way to fix the problem. So I, I think we get Trump in there, we'll get it. And now Trump might be willing to go to constitutional crisis levels to make it happen. I would assume so. I mean, if, if he promises to do that, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to vote for him and campaign for him because uh, that's that's really what has to happen. We have to. Uh, and there's some bureaucracies which I've listed in the constitutional reforms, which just I mean, the Department of Education has to go away. That's just not even a, a question. I mean, for a lot of things, the internet has made communication between the various competing elites so effective that there's no value in a hierarchy any longer. No, there's no communication thing. You know, this. And hmm. the other problem with education is we've tried to make it an intellectual and academic discipline, and it's not. It's craft, and it can be taught as a. It can be taught as a. As well, a I, I think that's where that's one of the. I think that was the weak point of the uh, entry of what. Mr. Lindsay is calling the parasite entry point into the uh, 
control apparatus of our civilization right. because it's like it is like what is it edd so doctor of education is like a, it's a clown world I mean, for a 10 degree there's nothing to be a doc a, there's nothing to be a doctor about um uh in education there just isn't you, you uh, if you look at what they've done in education it's almost i mean this is the argument it's all pseudoscience the same thing has happened if you look at this what's being uh what science is being falsified in other words where all the retractions are it's on the left matter of fact all the science that's false is based on trying to few um trying to uh, push leftist theology and since the, the the methods in sociology and psychology are unscientific right they're they're not science except for in very rare cases there's some very rare cases in psychology which have to do with uh, cognitive bias you know basically what we do wrong they're really good at um uh, iq is a fantastic success right uh the big the 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 big five and the fat and the factors and the facets on 10 facets that's pretty good but if you look at the rest of it it's mostly bad uh, as you can see by the therapy numbers and uh, education is mostly bad as you can say, see by the rise in mental health issues so we know these things are wrong there's no question about them so how could they be scientific if the output because this is the thing i want to get across Science is not what you do. It's the result of what you have done. In other words, it's only it's only sci it's only scientific if you're in the during the process. At the end, it's not science if it's false, right? I mean, that's the answer. No, no, it's not. It's not science if it's false. It's just theory, and so, it's it's empirical. You're you're judged by the empirical uh, results, right? Which is so, the technology that you've developed using your science, and it's like, yeah, they've made ineffective science. And so it's 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 no, I mean, it's not science. It's it's pseudoscience. That's the point. Oh, I see. It's, it's uh, so it, 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 yes, you have not been able to make something of it. You and so what you consistently do that by the same principles. Whatever principles you're using and whatever methods you're using are pseudoscience. So, I mean, the leftism is purely pseudoscience. We know why. It's an att organized attempt to reverse the Darwin Darwinian explanation for everything. You know, what is a my well, well, <laughs> that, that, that requires elucidation, that statement. Well, the Darwin organized just... attempt to reverse Darwin at every turn. Right. And so, you know, it's the, what is Darwin what saying? Is... Right. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Dar Darwin is like the last philosopher. He's the end, right? All we're doing is applying it to some degree. So if you look at um, uh, the scarcity of the universe, well, there's scarcity in the universe. That's and that, that ends up with Malthus der derived from Darwin, right? Yes. You end up with, uh, you end up with behavioral psychology. Well, um Darwin says we're 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 uh, selfish agents that cooperate for for personal benefit, and who and uh, there is no direction other than uh, capture of energy and greater precision. In other words, there's an increase in the capacity of capture energy within a within a um, uh, some some aspect of the world, some portion of the world, time and space. Well, and then humans, of course, we are we we specialized in special in, in generalization. In other words, the whole thing about humans is we can adapt to anything by changing our minds instead of our bodies, right? So that's why we're so successful. But you know, you you get down to what what are humans are amoral. I love this thing. Humans are naturally immoral, or humans are naturally moral. It's neither. Humans are naturally amoral, and we're practical. It's just that pra practical to be moral, and it's impractically immoral, except when it's practical to be immoral. Right? I mean, it just <laughs> uh, so we're 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 just acquisition machines, and then you get into the evolutionary side of Darwin, which is that um, genetic load, right? 
right? We mutation, genetic load accumulates, genetic load accumulates in lowest classes and drops down, right? And there's and uh, there's a continual testing rotation. And so what you have is you have people who are unfit. And you have generations of man, four generations of man at least, mankind, which we call the races, which are increasingly fit and decreasingly unfit. And for what? Well, for what? For competition against the generations that followed. So, you know, it's just what it is, uh, you know, and, and so Darwin explained all this, which means that, you know, and, and so what is what is Marx? What is Bose? What is Freud? They're all a th revolts against Darwin. You know, what what is what is uh, Cantor's math? It's a revolt against geometry. What is uh, uh, in other words, the Western way of thinking. What is um, Levantin? It's a revolt against Darwin. What is Gould? A revolt against Darwin. Uh, what what are um, what are the my my legal opponents? Uh, Dworkin, Rez, and Kelsen. What are they? They're revolts against Darwin. You know what is um, what is the civil rights era? It's a revolt against Darwin by trying to trying to escape Darwin, which was that the the black community was doing just fine, thank you very damn much, developing their own, and we destroyed them by trying to interfere. It's the same thing with I say with slavery. We tried to interfere with the process that would have normally just gone gone on its own, and we knew that at the time. So, so uh, uh, the the. Everything the left does is everything the feminine does, which is revolt against Darwin. Why does the feminine revolt against Darwin? Because the woman has no choice, but because her children are so expensive, to put everything she can in ignoring Darwinian pressures and making her child survive. Well, this instinct, what turns out to be the left's instinct, they don't realize that it's just a monkey instinct under there that's driving them it isn't reason they they like to justify the monkey instinct with lots of reason but as you see since they're the primary purveyors of the war against darwin and the pseudosciences i mean i collect pseudoscientists right in this big fucking list i have right and they're almost all jewish right which is feminine right not all jewish but most of them are jewish and the great thing the ones that are best are the jewish ones that aren't then there's some of the best thinkers are people who are jewish who are actually thinking like Christian, no, Westerners. So, so, and then you get the women who go along with it. So, I mean, we brought in women and the Jewish thought and whatever. We brought this into an age of revolt against Darwin. And this is where we are is we've experienced a century of pseudoscience. We're trying to get out. But the problem is they, you, they captured the institutions to institutionalize pseudoscience the way the Christians, the Jewish Christians, captured the Roman institutions uh, to teach uh, theological pseudoscience. So, I mean, we, we have the same process going on over and over again, which is why this feels like the late Republic, because it is. <laughs> What's them is like, well, Sorry. Fool, fool, fool me once, you know, shame on you, but fool me twice, shame on me. And the, the problem is, you know, and I'll, I'll go off on this in a second. I know this bothers you a little bit. Is, is that it's the, it's, the Christians are the fucking problem. They're the reason we oh. can't fix it, because they're so, the Christians are the reason we can't fix it. Tell me why. Because I can't say you can't lie anymore, and when it's lying. Why? Why can't you say that? Well, no, because they won't have it. I mean, this is I spent a fucking year and a half on this problem. Okay. Is that the, the uh, a Christian needs to believe they're not fundamentalist nonsense? They have to believe it. They can't live, they can't bear a world where everything they've invested in, their whole cognitive framework has to be restructured. And the neural economic cost of indoctrination into fundamentalism is unovercomable, which is exactly why it's so resistant. Now they're resistant to communi the communism and stuff because it's a it's an anti-theological standing, but they're not against it for the right reasons. <laughs> You know, they're against it because it's anti-theological, not because it's anti-Christian. I mean, it has a differing objective. So, right. so I mean, I can't. This is a. This is a. You see, you see, you, you uh, sent me that wonderful link yesterday with uh, Lindsay and some uh, Christians, and yeah. I watched, and I watched the Christians, and I'm like, I love you, fucking people. You're wonderful, right? But I don't want them governing anything. 
you know, that, that's 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 the worst possible thing to have, right? But I think so. Lindsay's having a great of success with philosophy and in, in the theological frame around right. Christian nationalism, and the Christian nationalists, despite being fundamentalists and what I consider lunatics, they're actually the only resisting force. The, 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 the other, so it's this horrible situation we're in <laughs> that uh, where, where uh, the enemy is using the, the same method Christians use to bring about the same destruction, but the Christians view that history as constructive, not destructive. And so you can't, and so Christians are going to resist anything I try to do just as strongly, which is truth, just as strongly as the left is going to resist it. And so I was like, well, we're, we're fucking, we're doomed. No, no, I don't. So I, don't, I would go like this. It's like the issue is, is um, it, the the issue appears to me to be that uh, a multitude of independent states allows for the expression of the Christian national, the Christians that are nationalists to their to their full extent. And if you allow them to to express themselves as they see fit within their polity, that they are happy. So you'll have more Utahs, basically, but on different kinds of Utahs. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Which is a good it. thing. Yeah. So it's like it's like you could they and they'll be happy with that. And they I'm going to move wherever it. the goddamn uh, uh, all, what do they call them the the Mennonites and the um, the Amish Amish wherever they govern is where I want to live. They're right. They're they got it right. They're, they got it wherever is, they govern. I, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm gonna go and do whatever the hell they say. <laughs> uh, I'm still gonna be an Englishman, but if they they say it's government, I'm going there. Anyway, the only ones that aren't crazy. So it's like I think that's um that's okay. So it's like I think that's a positive thing. It's like those guys are uh, working together to. Um, I think that they're they resonate along the same lines as we do. Well, I mean, I I I agree with that, but it's why Lindsay can't say the truth. You know, it's like because he can't address this issue because it will affect not only the left but the Christians and Jews. So how do you prohibit what he's saying? But in other words. I know how to prohibit the future crimes, right? I know how to legislate against their crimes. And I can do that because the courts can defend against it. So what good is understanding what the left does if you can't stop it? Well, the issue is this, it's, it's insufficient. Because see, well, the, the issue was this, is that the it, it appears that Lindsay's doing the best he can in the field that he's operating within, which is philosophy. And that's talky talky. And it's like, okay, that's what he's doing. And it's okay. He's doing it, what everything that he can do because he does, he's, he's limited in scope because it's, yeah, a, I'm not criticizing. Jim. No, no, I know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just getting there. It's like, but the issue is this, it's insufficient. It doesn't solve the problem, which is looming and imminent. Uh, and so it's like, but it prepares the, it prepares the groundwork or the understanding of what is occurring by the actors that will come. Right. But I'm still, so th this goes back into, uh, uh, I want to state a first principle construction of what's gone wrong and what's gone right so that um, it can't happen. Not only is it fixed, but it can't happen again. Right. Right. And so uh, how can I do that when uh, I when I have to fight against a message that is it's not a feminine Jewish and cognitively female spectrum doing this and it's in unendable. Right. It has to be legislated and outlawed. Yeah. Right. Uh, versus whatever it is they're recommending which i don't know i hear complaining i hear yeah, they're not recommending they're just describing right but now i'm still stuck with this christian thing of um you you in order to explain from first principles upward i've got to explain the female behavior the feminist behavior the jewish behavior 
the Christian behavior and the Marxist series behavior has all applications of the same thing. You know, and this is why I said I uh, at the end of my work, I said you have to explicitly allow Christianity because for all, because while Catholicism is essentially uh, the synthesis, right? It's a spiritual explanation for natural law, Catholic dogma. The Protestant Bible is, isn't. It's not a special. It's not a search for natural law. The natural law program survived Protest Protestantism anyway. So I'm just looking at this as, you know, and maybe another country you could get away with it, but another country you don't have free speech. There's no other free speech country left other than the United States. And then uh, if we go to, but in the United States, they've got this, we've got both the left and the Christians and the women. It's like, I don't know, how, you know, fuck. It's just, there's, that's a coalition of the stubborn that makes it very difficult to make anything out. And then you add on top of that, the Nazi impulsive boys that are mad boys that can't think about anything other than breaking rocks. You know, you're like, okay, how do you fix this? How do you fix this problem? I see. I, 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 I um, regard it as these are fairly marginal groups. I don't think that they're, they're the, uh, the bulk of the population. This the stubborn ones that you're talking about. Well, the bulk of the talking population is this. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. So you, the, they're the noisy ones. Yeah. And it's like the the issue is this: is the 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 actors are not talkers. That's correct. We saw that they don't they don't appear on the radar, and so you underestimate their their magnitude. It's really true. The guys showed up. The, the guys that showed up with guns. Were, um, were they didn't have a lot of words to say. They're just quiet, and it's like few words. It's like, and they're like, also okay. in charge of stuff. They're like they're, I'm using my common prose again. They have occupations where they're actually in charge of people, so they actually understand people. They're not ideological; they're just practical. What I would call empirical. They're working about on people. They, their understanding of people is based on the evidence. But they they because it's like this. There's not application. You don't do book learning to figure out how to run the team. No, it's just it, it doesn't matter what the book says. It only matters if the team does their job. And there's and the other thing part I like that there's no psychology or sociology involved in telling the truth. <laughs> it's important. That's a profound it's statement. Not politics. I, I just want to make that clear how important that statement is. There's no need for psychology or sociology when you're telling the truth. When you're, whenever you're managing people, it doesn't that if you're if you're getting into psychology and sociology, you're trying to you you're either trying to preserve a lie, protect a lie, or create a, 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 a suggest a lie or produce a lie. And the truth is how you man. It's how you manage people effectively. It's how they want to be managed. Um, what they want to be told is uncomfortable truths with truths with compassion. Yeah, you know, I mean, if they don't want to be told an uncomfortable truth with criticism, like I can't afford you to pay that because, frankly, I can replace you with somebody better than you for them for more than that, and I can't, and the mar and it doesn't support it, right? Uh, but I'd prefer to keep you because we're we have a relationship, right? In other words, the relationship has value, but at some point, the 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 money has more value than the relationship. As long as you tell people that it's they're they're fine, right? They just like I can't, I can't, I can't. I mean, it's just if you want to find another job, I'll help you find another job. I'll give you a good recommendation, but this job doesn't pay more than that. It's too many inputs. Right? I don't think the public understands the word imputation, so I won't like, try to explore <laughs> that. But uh, you know, the thing, the cost to make a thing does determine uh, the minimum the price you can have. charge for a thing, right? I mean, there's a the point of saying, well, I mean, I'd like to, uh, you know, the market will pay fifty dollars for this, and my imputation is says that well, I can produce it for twenty, so that's good. But if the imputation says it will cost sixty dollars and the market will only pay fifty, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have a choice. I mean, if I have your job, I can only divide up the labor of getting this work done, this with this many pieces, and still have enough money 
to take the risk to produce the thing that it might sell in the market at that baby price instead of a discount. You know, the people I always like, I always love to educate people into talking about women's blouses, right? So try to sell, this is a great example of how stupid shit is. So I've got, a, so some, I want, I have an idea for a design of a woman's blouse and you want to pick that because there's so many of them and they're so perishable and they're so, um, there's so much in, in the moment, right? Yeah. And so, but you got to make so many extra small, small, uh, smalls, mediums, larges, and extra larges. You got to pay. Well, the truth is, you don't really know what that distribution is, but it's probably going to be that there's more smalls and mediums than there are larges and extra larges and extra small. But you don't know because it might be that extra small girls actually prefer in this particular moment like that. So, what you do is you send these things out that cost you $4 to make. You sell them for 80, all right? Why? Because you're only going to sell the uh, half of the mediums, larges, and uh, and smalls, right? And uh, right. There's a mismatch uh, between consumption and- Not and even production. half of them, maybe a third of them, right? Right. And so at that point, then there, there's not enough choice to make the consumer feel good about making the purchase, right? It's, it's been sold out to me. So then it gets put on the discount rack for half price, which is now $40, right? <laughs> and so now they're going to sell a, what, some small percentage of that unsold material and ask itself for 40. And then you're going to, well, eventually what happens is this stuff gets off to the, you know, Marshalls or whatever. I don't know that, I don't know these places anymore, right. but whatever discount store it is that, or outlet stores or right. over to fucking Nigeria and goddamn, pallets you know to get rid of them just to or uh, some of them get basically turned into turn into cotton so they can be made into paper or god knows what else right so uh that's so what did you really make well the net price you made on that four dollar thing was probably eight dollars which was right this but so but the woman who pays eighty dollars for it gets pissed off saying well why are you eighty dollars when it's four dollars worth of materials and labor right well because it, it's you you the eighty dollar person is paying the price for having the thing right in the first place but you know if you're way down the line and you're like an extra large woman with god knows in america where there seem to be more and more of those maybe you'll be able to put this thing on and, and wear it for eight dollars instead of which is exactly. which is why the the eighty dollar lady needs a new shirt. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> this is just unseemly. The four dollar so, shirt. Is... So it's like, well, because the point is, is that goods are the price of goods is speculative, and it's not equal, right? So I mean, no good sells for its full price during right. its entire lifetime, and so you're calculating, you're you're calculating all that risk right this is what i want to participate in a uh, worker say i want to participate in profits i'm like sure you want to participate in losses too because i've had million dollar losses and they fucking suck they're hurt <laughs> i've had that i've had that chunk taken out of my ass <laughs> yeah, it's not just, pleasant it's like no. wow huh? i mean that's i had gonna, a, that's gonna leave a mark i lost two million dollars on i mean morally like I, I can think of two cases where I lost two million dollars, right? You know, and, mm. and they're both good. They were both, uh, in those cases, they were both uh, predictions of an upside that didn't materialize because of third parties' actions, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. well, I can't control this, right? I mean, this is somebody made a stupid decision which killed the market that I had, right? So, no, oh, no, three. I had a, bought a company too. So, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of these things that go out and happen. So you lose money. But I'm happy. You wanna you wanna you wanna participate in the upside? I'll tell you what. You know how often an upside comes out to an owner when he sells the fucking business. So you wanna work here for twenty years and then get a get a piece of the upside. That's called shares and stock. But in the meantime, it's just fucking noise, right? I mean, that's what that is from the owner's perspective. So you just tell people, well, you're, you're, you you want to participate in management of the company, then you could participate in the profit and loss of the company. Now, the problem is that you're, gonna, you're not going to want to pay for the loss given your val the value of your contribution to the company. So, I mean, that that's the whole point of being paid a salary, uh, a right. salary or certainty. a wage. Certainty. Is, is you outcome. get it with certainty instead of uncertainty. You know, like I sell a company every three, four, five, ten years, right? And I make a 
bunch of money. But you know, in the in the first two years that I build a company, I make nothing. Yes. Right. So you anyway. So I mean, this is a whole. And the second thing is we have we, they always bring up this one company in uh in Spain or Portugal, Spain that that is like run like Marxist. It actually isn't. They talk about it like it is, but very few people who have membership in the who actually uh work for the company actually participate in the owner mm -hmm. the governing company you know why they don't want to the second thing is they're in a town where there's no other fucking business right they sell things to the marketplace they're the, they sell goods that other people make in the marketplace right it's not but they make the fringe product on the margin on the edge so they make things that other people can't other bigger companies don't find profit in making. So, like, so, you know, you can't generalize this particular thing where you have a captured population oh, in a low income <laughs> area, right? Mar producing marginal goods mm -hmm. on the edge uh, that are edge factors of the broader economy and say, we can generalize that. Well, I mean, even when they try, they can't get people to participate in it because they don't want to. And even if they did, they quickly learn, shit, this sucks. So the issue is that you, you, you just said they can't, you can't generalize. And in fact, you can. It's just what we call a lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, because they do, right? And it's just like, of course, you can overgeneralize. I, I, I the, you know, the the biggest power I I've found as a CEO is to is to not say no. Um, is to say, well, how would we do that? Hmm. And who would do that? And uh, what would they not do in, in by doing that? What would that cost? Yeah. Right. And how certain is the revenue that would come from? So this is the why, why to uh, many employees, certain processes appear inefficient, but they aren't. They're inefficient because that inefficiency is how we accommodate, we accommodate risk. Um. And then you know you then you when some employee does have something, I'll say, well, go figure it out and come back to me. I'm not going to tell you no, right? If you want to take initiative, because some because like I said, one in a hundred, the person comes back and is like, I actually can get away with this, you know? Right. Like, Fuck. Okay, you're in charge. Promote it. Go take care of it. Right. I mean, but I mean, ninety nine percent of the time, they don't ever come back because they realize it was a stupid fucking idea. And you didn't tell them that they but used their own brain to figure it out. Brain. I like that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, I might explain at a time. I mean, like, well, we tried this thirty times, and I mean, here's how many. <laughs> it's just there's a, there's a legacy here. Yeah. Or the 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 big one that most people fall prey to is because they have a motivated reasoning, motivated reasoning, right? They can they have an interest that other people should share that interest when they don't. Hmm. So, I mean, yeah, you want that because it makes your life easier for you and your employees and whatever, but it makes their mm -hmm. life harder over here. So, I mean, it's they're not going to do that. So the maximum, you're already working at the maximum efficiency because the maximum efficiency isn't determined by your efficiency. It's determined by the efficiencies and the will, I guess, across, the, across all parties involved. So I say studying, studying incentives is... Again, the base value of understanding of economics is the study of incentives. So you, you learn to think through incentives instead of what you think is right. This is the problem, right? We grew up being told what is right as if it's a fucking universal. That means I'm the measure of what's right, right? So these right, people- It's a human, are, human measure and it's intuitive it, and it's functional. And it's my, my measure is what's right, right? From my perspective. Right. Right. And then, you know, then we have the golden rule. We'll think about their perspective. I'm like, yeah, but their perspective is still wrong or immoral, right? I mean, that, it doesn't mean, mine might be, theirs might be, whatever. The question is, what does it take to get the thing done, right? I mean, can it be done morally? And so you have these people that think their their judgment is useful and what they actually just don't understand all the incentives involved. But that's a very interesting. So as it goes to this uh, premise of perspectivalism, right? Yes. Which is the the in 
the inconsistent nature of perspectives. Perspective is just another word for being ignorant. No, it is. Find me a case where it isn't. <laughs> I just find that amusing. I'm going to write. No, no, it. It's one of those. It's one of those things I just throw out here every now and then that sounds silly, but it's actually really important. But from your perspective, I'm like, well, that just means you're ignorant. <laughs> because that's not fully accounting. And once you fully account for something, then it's not a perspective. It's a full accounting. It's only a perspective if you're ignorant. <laughs> there you go. I was trying. I thought I could get some out of you on that one. That was pretty good, man. I wasn't going. It is a form of ignorance. I mean, we're trying to rise above this perspectival function and have a uh, but universal uh, system of measurement, yeah? Yeah. What's interesting is this, the, the people are, the resistance to that notion is the, the premise that they can't imagine such a thing to be possible. Uh, say that again. I, I thought I had it and I lost it. It's the uh, the the uh, universal system of uh, commensurable measurement using language, right? A universal language that's applicable generally to all human experiences. It's, it's it's audacious, and it's like the the resistance to that notion must stem from the fact that. They don't imagine such a thing to be possible. Possible, You're right? And, and you can understand. I mean, to me, it's it's a reasonable thing because we found this with everybody who learns this, right? This that doesn't make sense until you get it. Then when you get it, everything is simple. <laughs> I mean, you. I remember when you went there, right? It was like oh, shit. It's just really simple, right? I mean, so you, you you once you get it, it's really simple. But how do you imagine a thing like that? before you don't understand it. It, it. It's just, it's impossible. So I, I told, it's like, I was laughing yesterday. I watched your video, I was laughing. I completely understand why people think I'm nuts, right? I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a natural response. It's because it's a completely <laughs> natural response. But, Which is uh, an interesting function because it's like the, the, the and we're gonna go to this, the, we're gonna go to Lindsay, back to Lindsay again, because it's like the, it, it, He's talking about uh, wizards, and they're not wizards, they're sorcerers. They are lying and generating um, misleading signals to control the herd for their own purposes. And you're just, you're a wizard, you're a magi, which is, this is how it really works, and you can understand it, and... It, it, it can it just and nobody needs crazy. to be able to manipulate you at all right nobody needs to manipulate nobody needs to be able to manipulate, manipulate you you don't need to be vulnerable to the manipulation right and we can identify the sorcerers and 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 their actors and their followers and that's all that is necessary yeah is it yes well identifying them is costly Prosecuting them is more costly. And for them, manufacturing their lives is really cheap. So the problem is creating, making it so costly that the manufacturing of lies is too, exp too expensive to try. But given the want of magical thinking, the desperation people have for getting a discount, the desire to lie, cheat, steal, it's a lot. I mean, it, right. I used to no, get no, the, the great. In my, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. I, I just don't lose your, your train of thought. When I got originally, uh, when I first came out with incremental suppression, uh, yeah. people thought this was really funny because it was at the same time Hop was using um, physical removal. And so, the, the, the you know, in, incremental suppression at the uh, until the point of physical removal. It was just a, a joke going around the Terry community. But the reality is, is, if you look at how much time and effort man has put into incrementally suppressing uh, irreciprocity <clears throat> to the point where it's even imaginable that the world could be ethical and moral, 
like most of us. Th th that's a that's a phenomenal feat. Because we you know you have all these stupid fucks out there saying man is naturally altruistic. No, <laughs> people are naturally fearful, and uh, some of them are more fearful than others. And then want to avoid conflict, they become altruistic. They buy their safety. They bought by their social safety. But we're not altruistic. We're absolutely the opposite. We can be, in other words, we're we're uh, not even, nor are we the absolute opposite, which is predatory. We're just practical. And so we're altruistic when it serves us. And we're, we're aggressive when it serves us. We're ethical when it serves us. And we're moral when it serves us. We're and, and unethical and immoral and evil when it serves us. We're whatever we can get away with. And so the problem is creating fences. We have to create a fence against the ability to come up to, to institutionalize the feminine means of warfare, criminality, antisociality, uh, or uh, an antisociality, criminality, and warfare uh, by uh, equally suppressing it as we have, we have male because it's finally able to mass communicate and, uh, and give women uh, economic and political power on a scale where we need to suppress the female method of uh, uh, antisociality, criminality, and warfare, which is what we call this magi stuff, right? Whatever you want to call it, magi, whatever you call sorcerer stuff, right? Which is manipulation. All right. And so this this plays into the um, what I was going to interject there, which is that the great hurdle in my impression in the population is this desire to remain within moral guidelines and not to apply, not to behave in an immoral fashion against people who are clearly behaving in an immoral fashion against you, which is like you're, you're, you're going to a gunfight with a knife and don't do it. Well, <clears throat> Christianity, some degree succeeds by um, forgiveness right, of pettiness. These humans are terribly petty. Um, not as petty as chimps, but pretty petty. <laughs> and um, so you suppress pettiness because um, it prevents, by preventing retaliation, you're baiting people into not being petty. Yeah, but the issue is the, the sorcerers are not being petty at all. No. And so... Uh, uh, so what, what the, my point was, though, is that the, the Christian ethic, which is total, to, totalitarian, in other words, you, you, it's total forgiveness, right? It's total submission, total forgiveness, gets away from the equilibrium, which is that there is, was like, there they call violence evil, except it isn't. It's neutral. Yes. It's put violence to good or evil ends. Um, so it's a mistake. It's, it's a, a category error. Well, it's a category error because the way Christianity made itself work with very simple rules is to make absolutes, right? So you you don't have to think about whether this case is a correct application. You just say, in all cases, regardless, I should do this. And right, so, so you, it, this goes to uh, Jesus's response to the money changers. And it's like it's a it's a it's a what I would call an exception, right? Yeah. Say it, because the audience doesn't necessarily know what you mean. Well, Jesus applied violence to the uh, money changers in the temple, and that's an exception to the nonviolence rule or law or whatever you want to call it of Christianity. Right. But, <clears throat> so, so, and this is where a Christian will say to me. But it's masculine. Look what Jesus did. I'm like, you know, that's not exactly raising a fucking army and R A I S I N G raising a raising an army and then raising R A Z I N G a city, right? I mean, that, that's not you know that's 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 having a tantrum, uh, uh, which is what Jesus did. He had a tantrum. He didn't actually use violence, right? He didn't do any real harm you know hitting people with a whatever he hit him with was you know 
was probably added later, which is probably uh, isn't is just a tantrum. It isn't real violence. Violence means you you're hurting. Right, people. organized about it. Right, and you're organized about it. So uh, I say Christians, are, you know, you know, the problem is that the the only reason Christians developed any military was the reintroduction of the of uh, Arianism by the Vikings into Europe, which is what made possible the Crusades. But before that, uh, Europe was basically um, uh, denu uh, uh, denuded. It was weak, and it was made Christian and weak, which is precisely why it was easy for the Vikings to come in to take advantage and restore because they were weak. Christianity is a submissive religion of feminine weakness by absolute tolerance, right? It's not really nice and good. It's good for the peasants, but it's only good for the peasants if you have an aristocracy of professional warriors to allow you to believe stupid shit, just like it's only Western civilization is only useful if you have men who are professional politicians and warriors and businessmen to let women get away with their stupid shit. And right now, women are getting away, women and the betas and the priests are getting away with their stupid shit because we're not being warriors and politicians and economists like we need to be. Christianity only exists successfully. It's, Christianity is just communism without aristocracy. And aristocracy is just feminine. And so you need the masculine aristocracy. And there are a group of us who are still masculine or primarily we're Christian in the sense that we have Christian ethics, but we're aristocracy first, which is we're defenders. We're defenders of feminine privilege to not be for, not use force. You have to have it. But Christians can't deal with that. They think you could have a a churchy world again, and that's where they're wrong. Can't. Never was a churchy world. It was always well, it was until the Vikings showed up and start taking all this well, stuff. Even then, out there, the there was just, you say that, but I mean, you know, you, you know, the the it took quite a while to bring the church into being to any significant factor. I mean, they could forcibly most Christianity was due to forcible conversion because it would get status political status and support from Rome. So it was not like it was everybody just ran to this hokey religion. So I mean the, I don't I, I keep going off on Christians because I hear all this tough talk and this moral shit. All it sounds like is it's like fucking bunny rabbits running around in top hats. I mean this is not there's nothing to it at all. <laughs> but the one thing about the fucking Nazis is they're and fucking morons, but at least you can, at least you could stick a weapon in their hand and they go do something with it, and they might even show up. So anyway, it's just frustrating. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on that on down that rat hole. That will be a rabbit warning, actually, not a rat hole. Okay. <laughs> That's I mean, all. Just, I just don't understand uh, the the how we went from. The post-war macho to this this uh, men with vagina hats, uh, boys <laughs> with vagina hats. That made me sad. That image. <laughs> Four generations, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, and and uh, who's doing this? Uh, I think John Hayde is doing a pretty good job of talking about it really happened uh, in the 2000s. And especially it took root after 2015. But it's really the Obama era that that took it across the border. And so what I'd like to what I'd like to know is why. It, and so John Hayde's blaming it on the Internet. And I'm like, you know, you know, it certainly didn't hurt. Uh, to create, but the real problem is the, and he says but before that, it's mass media created this fear of there's like child predators behind every, you know, behind every car door. I mean, that's right. So they created. And so the, the, the helicopter mothers and right. parents. And, and why are they? And so what created helicopter mothers is the introduction of too many work mothers into the workplace. So they don't have enough control over the, the, over their children. They're not right. watching, right? And so, likewise, what's making and and so, 
we've made it, we've removed every incentive, not only to have children, but we've had removed every incentive to be a mother, which has removed every incentive to monitor children as a lifeguard so that they, they stay within these, bounds, right? They stay within bounds. So we end up with, we end up with snowflakes, right? And so, so it's like the pill, the workforce, uh, the, uh, the paranoid uh, helicopter mom overprotectiveness, the um, uh, internet and the instant, the mental illness caused, especially by girls. That really affects boys, but the mental illness, especially, it's caused girls. It's huge. And then what the problem with boys is, they say it's uh, uh, the pressure. Well, the problem with boys is they can't engage in adversarial competition. But why do they do that? Well, they, they can't engage in adversarial competition because they tried to make the classroom more amenable for girls instead of, and, and, and they kept making it less amenable for boys. So boys checked out of education, right? They just see it as torture, basically. Because it kind of is. Because it is. So, I mean, when I was, you know, it was really obvious to me going to dip, uh, all male classes versus mixed classes. How much better it was. Mm. So much better. Because you can be talked to as men. And girls, you can't talk to girls. Okay. And then uh, girls behave very differently. They're also incredibly fucking petty. And so what you see in the girls' school, what I saw, one of my sisters, she's been taking it anymore. She went to public school after a while. It's because it's so fucking petty. Uh, hmm. And so uh, I thought it was that was incredible. same thing. What I that's why I had a male dorm in college is because you get the male bonding, right? Yeah. So <laughs> how are we back to this? We were supposed to be talking about how. We we're talking about, about how this um, we see some. It seems hopeless. We see some success. One of the people we like be, who's being successful is Lindsay, and his message. It is helpful and educating, but is it? It's not sufficient for correcting. No, but, and that's the error of the philosophers. They 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 think it's a talky answer. And so, well, you see this in all of us. Need more either. And so then there's the um, uh, uh, the problem we have is that, however, uh, the mass of the population needs something simple. That's right. The uh, the uh, some intellectual population, the online intellectual population, can make use of what um, the philosophers are saying, and then, but it's very hard to find enough people that can understand what I am or we're saying. Because it's frankly, it's scarce. It's a scarce that, knowledge. Right, right. We're in agreement now. The because it requires so much effort to uh, uh, be fluent and understand. Right now, I could do what we have, which is make the make the the posters in the Constitution, right, and say, well, this is really all it is, right? And it's these basic things. <clears throat> yes. Um, but I, my my impression is this is not this is not necessary because it's like the 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 masses do not need to understand the masses need to understand the incentives that are put in place to cause them to be behave in a manner that is action. That's all I, that needs. To I be. would say that they just need to know the policy changes we would make. I don't even think that's necessary. They have to have confidence that. You're going to generate policy that's going to make correct take corrective action for certain outcomes that they prefer, and that's all they need. They need they want the the masses of Americans have an unsatisfied demand for change away from this sorcery to a truth based system that is. Uh, Rewarding of their morals and their uh, behaviors, right. okay. and 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 ceases to oppress them. 
and allows them to uh, have confidence that their their preferences are going to be met with uh, um, at least open ears, as opposed to merely ignored and trampled upon. That's all they need, and it's like so the the the. They just need to see, they need to have some sense of what the demands are that are going to be imposed by their action. I, okay, yeah, um, I'm going to go back to who are the foot soldiers for the left and who are the foot soldiers for the right? Foot soldiers of the right are the Christian. Foot soldiers of the left are, are the, you know, the, the Antifa, BLM, and Soros and those. Yeah. So the problem is, is that what you're, is that the foot soldiers are the people who are politically interested and politically active. So the problem on, on the flip side is what you just described is the message to the people who are not foot soldiers and politically active. <laughs> and so this is the conflict: is how do you get that message out to people? My my view is that you you have to do it through to get by getting attention. And the way you get attention is by showing up in enough numbers. So you have to create a minimum number of people to show up enough numbers to satisfy the middle, right? The left. That's right. The middle. That's and, right. Yet at the expense of the fringe, right? You, you don't want those fringe people to be your, your foot soldiers because they actually don't, they, the, the people on the, on the right, the foot soldiers, they either want to, they want, either a, a Christian world or a fascist world. The people on the left, they want a communist world or, or and or socialist world. And those things are both bad. What we want is a rule of law world where everybody can have what they want. Right. And so uh, the policies we're proposing, get, let everybody have what they want. Instantaneously, no. A lot of people are going to have to move. Yeah, and that's okay. And that's okay. Uh, that's not a problem. Moving isn't a problem. If it matters, if it doesn't matter for you, to you enough to move, then it doesn't matter enough to you to complain about. So we would have a we would have a, when when the uh, nation states era arose, most people, a lot of people who'd previously been distributed as tribes all over European cities, they went back to their home territories. Because those home territories under nation states became dedicated to their interests. Well, I see the same thing happening now, which is when people would go to parts of North America that would be dedicated to their interests. And uh, the secret, of course, is if you're going to have a given culture in your area, you state in your constitution what the culture is and what's not permitted. So if you want to work and come there, you've got to integrate. If you don't want to integrate, they don't need you. It's not that complicated. The right to to not integrate, I don't know why that exists. <laughs> you know, there's why do you have integration needs paying costs in exchange for benefits? Well, if you want to go somewhere, you want the benefits. So why won't you pay the costs? The cost is integration. Now, if I like I wanted to go to, I can't think of, I probably think of somewhere I absolutely wouldn't want to go, like Dubai. It's fucking hot, very Muslim, right? It's very low crime, but it's very Muslim, right? And it's it's a very, a very status signal heavy place, right? Opposite, I, I'd rather live with a fucking Amish. So, but a pick a place like that, right? Would I have to integrate? Well, I, I would. I just would like it, but I would have to. Right? If I went to uh, the problem I had moving with Russian people is the directness. I'm pretty direct, but they're <laughs> they're brutal. It's offensive, right? Because I mean, part of being English, is really part part of being an American, is this over overuse of manners that we have. This is very commercial social structure. Or they have a very familial social structure. And so I, I kept getting into, I would get offended when I shouldn't be. And I would uh, be offended, not a really offensive, but be too polite. Too polite, which they view as being untrustworthy. All right. And it took me a while to sort of get that. And I'm like, I can integrate as much as I can, but I actually can't be 
that impolite. I mean, I can't I can't do it. I could be I could be polite as polite as I I mean I can be as direct as I can be while still being polite, but I can't be like them because I just can't. I mean, if you, I I just can't do it. So I mean, can you, you fail? To, you fail to integrate. I, I well, I mean, I I I I don't object. Nobody objects to it, but it's one of those things where they constantly notice that you're overly polite, and it's to them it's suspicious. Right. <laughs> so so if you want me to go to the Muslim world, like I just couldn't do it because I would view it as evil. And so, I mean, uh, can I integrate? Well, I, I wouldn't go to where that is, right? Eh? Right. Um, so, uh, so do you have the right to go somewhere that you don't integrate? Of course not, because it's basically stealing. You know, the great advantage America has is that we have we uh, we brain drain the fucking planet, right? So that white people get to take middle income jobs and not have to work that hard and go to college. Stuff. So <laughs> we brain train other countries who come here, and but the difference is, is that being highly educated essentially forces you under the Aristotelian frame, right? Because it's like, well, we, we're we're counting about results now, right? I mean, it's just education forces you under that frame, and then uh, you're here, and we're a little, we've had a little too much immigration, obviously. So it's putting a burden on our social structure, i.e. bowling alone. But anyway, I'll carry that away. So the, the whole point is the uh, that uh, we come to this, how do we, uh, let me see if I get this way. I like exploring what other people are doing. I like that the lenses of the world are being successful. I am a little dismayed <laughs> that it. I feel it's creating an obs. It's you know, it's like you don't want me to talk about the feminine Jewish Christian uh, Marxist sequence, and uh, because you think it's offensive, and I'm like, how do I outlaw it without showing it? And so it's, it, the, the, uh, the, this is interesting because it's like um how do you outlaw it it's the behavior that is problematic correct and so it is not necessary to do, show the origins and and first causes of the behavior in order to make it outlawed uh, i disagree i think that's that's the empirical, that's the empirical evidence I, I would argue that it 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 re, it generates um, propensities in a population that are disproportionate between populations, but it does not describe the behavior. It's not why, necessary why, to. Why shouldn't we demand Muslims and Jews reform or Christians, for that matter? Why shouldn't we? If or that's to do problem, what? Reform. Okay, I um I I'm unfamiliar with this demand. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Jewish sensibility is feminine, and it, and they have a long tradition of them. They believe they're right when they're actually wrong, and the re we know empirically they're wrong because of the evidence they've been kicked out so many times. They ignore their history, and on in other words, they re. It's no reason, no wonder they recreate reconstructive history for the West, which is what they've been doing now, because their history is an artificial construction of their in their biblical sense, and they've artificially laundered their history from the criminality that they've been involved in over the centuries. This is why they get punished. They say we're prosecuted for being different. It's not that you're different; it's that you specialize in organized crime. So I mean, that that's that's what they do. That's why they get kicked out. And so, so I, why why shouldn't they learn to look at themselves and say we need to have a reformation because this is why we're punished? Well, you know, why not? Well, because it works. The organized crime strategy that they engage in by feminine means is profitable for them, and they take a lot of pride in in how they what cleverness, they right? And so it's it's still criminal, but I mean they take pride in it. You never. Well, it's like that. This is this is a, a 
this is an interesting question because it's not it's not in my mind a legal question as much as a religious question uh, well i mean it's in their law too their law is I, ethical. well i'm i'm i understand that and i'm but my my point being um in order to um create a state it is not necessary to describe the origins of the misbehaviors that are being outlawed It's just it's sufficient to to describe the behaviors that are being outlawed and necessary and sufficient is all that's necessary in the law. You don't need to uh, go further the extra steps necessary to uh, describe the origins of the misbehavior because it doesn't matter. And you're saying law would be theory rather than evidence. You would say it didn't arrive from commonality; it arrived from theory. And that would be anti-empirical. Wait, law is empirical. I've derived this from commonality, which is the evidence of the of disputes over time. Uh, all right, so that's the, I only know about this because the crime exists. So I outlaw the crime because of the evidence of the history of crimes and what they bring about. It's not like off the top of my head. No, we're not in argument. It's just, it's, you can't say, uh, I, I don't know how I say something, this is just bad. Well, how do I know it's bad? And that's what's going to happen. It's going to be, how do I know it's bad? I have to show empirically that it's bad. I don't know how I how I get around the problem. Everything I do is based on a, a history of first principles that yep. create an arc over time. If I if every if this is the one thing I don't ignore when it's the one cause of the origin of the problem of the current age that just seems a little ridiculous to me I don't see a way around it now I can say that well I can go back to what you've always counseled in the beginning which is you say well I mean there's a difference between um, you know there's no crime no foul no 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 law no foul right there's no crime so no law no crime so if I mean you don't know it then that's fine. But after you know it, you have to stop. Well, you can't. That's great. Um, and then there's the fact that um, people just do things out of ancestral habit. They don't yeah. know what they're doing is criminal. That's true. I mean, certainly we learned that col uh, colonialization is a really a bad. That was uh, a bad idea. Right. So why haven't Jews learned that the baiting into hazard is a bad idea? Well, there's no it reason. Hasn't been demonstrated yet. It hasn't been demonstrated yet. So, well, but not sufficiently, apparently. What does do is Muslims know? Muslims think they're really they got the greatest thing going, but do they know they've destroyed the they've destroyed they've destroyed seven civilizations, reduced them and and reduced everybody to ignorance of superstition. Uh, yeah, but they they would regard that as a as a feather in their hat. Oh, God. I understand that. So, I mean, that's the same thing as the Jews require, believe their success is a, a feather in their hat when it's actually they must. crime. Because that's what everybody does. You, per, you persist your group evolutionary strategy by claiming it's a good. But right. We could disassemble all these group evolutionary strategies. We can, de we can deconstruct them and show how they're engineered. All right? And so they, we know what they are. It's the same thing with every civilization. I mean, because I can go back to India. Aside from the fact that there's no rotation, that's pretty fucking good. If you look at the West, our thing is we've been through reformations, a lot of them, at least four major cognitive reformations in our history. And uh, they're disruptive, and they've been very disruptive. But that disruption is what makes it possible for us to continuously evolve all the time. So by confronting our failures, and adapting, we become more moral. And other civilizations, by not confronting their factors and uh, not adapting, they be they maintain their immorality, and they wonder why there's conflict in the world. So, I mean, I don't, I, I understand that nobody wants me to say the truth, uncomfortable truth. But I mean, if the fundamental problem of our age is the is the uh, failure to suppress the feminine means of antisociality. Uh, crime and warfare that, uh, and that that crime and warfare has been demonstrated in a historical arc as extremely successful if we let it get out of hand 
And I think the 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 problem is that my job is to to articulate that history, explain how to outlaw it, and put put reforms in place that prevent it in the future, and then produce policies that correct for the crimes that's been committed. I mean, that's what I've done. So, sorry, so is the, is the issue is this: is the 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 science does not vilify anybody, but it explains the propensities of populations to be engaged in such behaviors. Correct. That's, that's all it does. There's, there's, that's a that's a different function. Well, no, that but that's what I'm saying. Is that your original counsel to me was I think correct, which is that it, we separate responsibility and blame. Right? You, you can be responsible for something, but not to be blamed for it. And it's the same thing as there's no there's no law, there's no crime. But there's, you know, uh, if there, we have to make the laws, it's a crime, so people have to reform. We can't, I can't just pull it on my ass. Or leave. I agree. I don't have a problem with that. So uh, I, I think the hard part is saying, well, I mean, do, do women know they're intrinsically evil? No, they, they actively uh, avoid <laughs> learning that, in my opinion. And, and we don't, and as, as sons and daughters, we don't want to believe that. But, uh, you know, it's true that when women are let on their own without the regulation of limits imposed by males, turns out they're pretty awful. Just like males without the regulation of women can turn out to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty awful. Although the truth is, it's men who regulate men on behalf of women, not women. So uh, these things, marriage turned out to be a good compromise and it was extremely successful. But if you look at today, I mean, those societies falling apart because the female has been out, gotten out of hand. Well, it's across the spectrum. So, I mean, it's it's an easily co correctable problem once you understand it. But uh, in other words, you say, but I don't know how to get around it without saying, well, you can't blame women for being women. You can't blame Jews for being Jews. You can't blame, you know, you can't blame uh, Jew, uh, continentals for being continentals. I mean, they don't have they don't have a fucking choice. They can't blame Indians for being Indian. I mean, it's, right? It's, you know, you what you can do is you say once you know better. Once you know better, you can do something about it. And so, well, right. So this is the, that's the issue. So that that's the issue is this is the fair enough, which is to say, it's like uh, the general is that generalities don't apply to any particular case, but they apply to the uh, aggregation of of cases. I don't know what that means. It means this. It's like the generality doesn't apply to any individual. The specifics only apply to the individual case. The generality has no has no meaning in the context of an individual case. They have to do with the aggregation of evidence overall. Right. I mean, it's like to say it's not. We can't. I can't help being an Anglo-American, right? I was born. I can't American. stop it. Right? You know, I, I won't. You know, and I have certain things. Uh, there's certain uh, cognitive weights and measures. You know, I have a. I have a, a bit of a what people might call a defect, which is I'm a little bit of an Aspie, and so I have a little uh, less tendency to go with flow. A little higher tendency to look for reason, uh, reason and evidence. Right, so you know, I'm just here by fucking accident. So somebody else is there by fucking accident, and that's not the case. The problem is if you is that once you realize what you're doing is bad, you stop. I mean, we we used to bleed people because we thought it was good for them to cure them of illnesses. Right, it was a fucking stupid, terrible idea. Right, but we thought it was good. Right, well, it's just no different from thinking you should cut people, let them bleed out the bad stuff or something. I mean, it's just a stupidity that's beyond it, measure. You know, it, goes to, it, it goes to this, uh, <laughs> this is my favorite, my favorite medical story from old times, is tobacco insufflation. Oh, well, you got to explain it because nobody... <laughs> For the audience, I will explain it. Tobacco insufflation is to be looked up because they used to have kits back around the turn of the 20th century that if someone drowned, and this still stuck in our uh, common parlance, which is if someone drowned, they're not dead until the doctor has insufflated tobacco up their ass, which is to say there's a there's bellows 
tobacco insufflation and until you blow smoke up their ass and they're still dead they're not dead yet and so it's like it's we we still say it you're just blowing smoke up my ass and it's like nobody knows what where that comes well, that from, comes from but, yes but that's it and it's like they you can look it up on the wikipedia there's pictures of these kits and they're just it's just like it's stuck in our common memory we use it in common language because it's dreadfully not it never works well i mean but you know mostly drowned people are drowned we used to use we did sacrifices we did all <clears> sorts <throat> of stupid shit in history right well i mean these are just stupid shit we did in history still sticking with us and we should feel bad about nobody should feel bad about hearing stupid shit from history with you i mean we're not omniscient Right. Uh, so, you know, we learn as we go away, as we progress, we learn more. And when, But once you know something, then if you, in other words, it's, once you know something's bad and criminal, you you can't do it anymore. You're on notice. Not, not around people who are in the wise. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's, that's what it comes down to, which is you're creating a state which forbids criminal behavior of the type that you're likely to be interested in conducting yes. because you don't think it is or, and it's like but we're not going to tolerate it yes and that's okay so there we are we're back we with, with um i i know it's not fun to talk about these things and i know i have to create an apologia for them for saying them but you no know, blame is different from responsibility, but if re you're responsible, you you're only to blame if you don't change. Now the problem is, if we don't for prohibit things like what we we call rent seeking, right? Yeah. Which is, we don't prohibit this and uh, across the spectrum, and I use that in its broadest sense, then then and people engage in rent seeking haven't we baited them into hazard by not prohibiting rent seeking yes right that's my point and so whose fault is it now it's all on us it's all on us so we come back to this all the time but what happens is the you know you can hold that idea in your head only so long but then i'll go through the arc of the narrative and you'll you'll what you'll do all of us will do is that won't be able to hold on to this idea of responsibility blame, that this is a natural thing. They will hold on to that long enough. They'll start to blame. Because if I tell the story of the narrative arc, you start seeing all the harm it did. And with all that harm, now you're just going to start to want to blame people. You're getting emotionally harm. charged up. Right. And so I, I'm like, I it's like, how, no matter what I do, uh, what if two things happens? I tell the truth, and either you're biased to say, "Well, this is a female Jewish, you know, natural problem," but you know, we were fine before these things. We let women in and let Jews in, which is true, right? And then we said, or and the other thing is to say, uh, "No, uh, this is the we've always done this. This is right. This isn't wrong. This is you're blaming us for something that isn't real or whatever." You get into this crap, either. You know, you get it to lie and deny, and each side. That's what's going to happen. No, that's that. That's the problem with the entering into the well, I mean, into the discourse because it's like um, the issue in my mind is this: is is <laughs> it's necessary to understand it, but it's not necessary to popularize that understanding. I, I disagree because that would be to lie and deny. I don't. I don't get the right to do that. Okay, I understand you. I don't have the right. I, I, uh, I'm leaving it in uh, in a um, well, I, I, I want neutral it, position because it, I'm like this. I'm like I I can I'm not going to argue with you. I think it's my job to be true. I think it's other people's job to decide what to say about it. Right. That's, well, that's what I'm working on. That's what I'm working on. So. Any event. So, um, th what does that mean? My view is, excuse me, fell asleep in a chair last night watching a fucking movie, so I didn't get 
What movie did you watch? Horrible. Oh, it was uh, it was horrible. It's called, <laughs> called okay. Stutz. It's called Stutz. Jonah Hill, who's a fat Jewish guy, of course he's fucked up in the head. I mean, he's really fucked up in the head. Okay, Jonah Hill, this, this comedian actor, whatever. So it's it, his uh, his psychiatrist is clearly got Parkinson's or something. So it's an he's trying to make a video about how this psychiatrist does his job. And it's sort of like a hero worship thing, right? Or preserve this because he's clearly dying. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, how much fuck up, fucked up can you handle? And I mean, I can't, I couldn't tolerate it. I mean, that's probably why I fell asleep, right? And so this is fucking horrible, right? How a, a, a crazy, you know, broken, emotionally traumatized Jewish guy and an old, uh, you know, old neighborhood, New York neighborhood, Jewish psychiatrist, right? Who's right, and who's specialized in talking to fucked up people his whole life, right? And it's just like this. And I'm like, I don't want to be infected by that much fucked up in this, right? I, you know, I just, and so I, my, you know, a friend of mine suggested it because uh, uh, it shows that it, it shows how. Uh, psychiatry can be practiced in one of the ways it can be practiced, right? By these little tools and visual images and stuff. And I'm always saying, well, we do it wrong because I'm saying we do this wrong because we could just do this, tell people the truth and we wouldn't have to play all these mind games, right? Like all these means of suggestion. So what happens is, is every psychiatrist develops his or her own method of suggestion mm -hmm. because it's what they understand. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it, it's like that you want to talk about factions or, or uh, what, what do you call it when churches have different occults, uh, different, yeah. what do you call it? Yeah. It, yeah um, Denominations. Yes. Yeah. All right. So you have these, you have this horrific number of denominations and, psychology psychiatry mm -hmm. which basically wrote, turned it into you know uh one one thousand versions of pseudoscience but they're all means of suggestion that work by whatever means they can get through so right. so I, I found it horrible i was it was just horrible it's horrible i don't want anything to do with brains that are that fucked up it's just that's too much crazy for me i respect that i run much. into a, a fair amount of it in my line of work uh, and it's just like okay, then just okay. And it, they're just there's they're bent, they are bent beyond beyond recovery. Some of them, which it comes down to this, which is that it it goes down to the junkie problem, which is this: it's like the people will continue to double down until they hit rock bottom. That's right. And it and it's like okay, and it's up to them to determine what rock bottom is. Yes. And they have to decide they've had enough, and then they can reform. Yes, that's all. And, and then and, and they'll either die, they either die or reform, right? And it's and the, and the great thing we've learned is, no matter what, if they're they're on the I'm going to die side, there's nothing you can do because they want to. The and issue is, to, is, is the behavior will go to extinction one way or the other. Yep. How about that? Yeah. And it's but the, the the interesting function as a caregiver in this context is that you have to be okay with it either way. It's okay. They get to pick their own fate, and that's just grand. That's the hard part. Because the people that get hurt, the, the people that care too much about the outcome and are are have their ego tied into the outcome are the ones that get injured. Yes. All right, so what's what are we uh, what are we accomplishing here? I think we've. I, I'm still trying to say. So, I don't want to. When I look at Lin, Lin, these guys, I'm talking about Lindsay because you brought this up, right? So I'm working on this right now. As I feel like he's being some, uh, reasonably successful at reaching certainly audiences, certainly reaching the Christian audience. Um, and no, that surprised me. I didn't. I didn't recognize that that speech set was going to be uh, in that frame. Yeah, religious term surprised me a little bit. Um, fundamentally, what he's studying, the Marxism, is just it's just religion. So I mean, that's right. It's a pseudo religion. 
you know, which is it, it, it. And I like his framing of it with it in the Gnostic function, because it fulfills the Gnostic reality, which is they are acting as God and they're projecting a reality into the population that is designed to control the population through the control imposition of morality, of false morality. Right. And it's like, that's perfectly Gnostic. And so sorcery is what we would call it, is what I call it. And um, it should be illegal. And that's okay. And that's, and and his framing is sufficient in my mind, but you don't agree. Because you're looking for first causes. Yeah, and you're I, explaining things that are, you're explaining it in a greater detail than is necessary for the population to understand in my understanding of. A yeah, problem. but I'm, I'm explaining it in a precision detail for a judges to adjudicate. That's the difference. I have to. That's what I have to do. Can I judge adjudicate this is different from can the population understand it. Um, and this is a, one of the things. It's a great topic to bring up. It's why the law is confusing to most people. Is because the judges the judges become aware. You're aware of the of what you what you're doing, right? And you think it's moral, right? But the judge is aware of the ten thousand permutations of that thing that are immoral. Does that make sense? So you're like it's like the opposite of the fish in the water, right? As and so you're you're sitting there and and so that's what people don't understand is that the judge is trying has to be able to write a proof, right, in order to make a judgment. And otherwise, he's left with subjective judgment, mm. and that is just random, which is what people don't like about courtrooms. And so the what I what I have to do is make adjudication possible. The way I make adjudication possible is I make decidability possible. I make decidability possible through construction of first principles by universal commensurability. So it's a big, so again, there's, I think it's one of those things where which, which direction are you looking at the object from? Uh, I'm looking at it from the direction of the judge, right? Right. Judge. In the Supreme Court, in particular, right, and so I'm trying to say, how would I adjudicate this? Uh, is it possible to adjudicate this? And um, it, and uh, I've created a means for total adjudication. There's no nothing that can't be adjudicated. So, um, uh, but I do that by construction for first principles, and I have to do it by commonality. The commonality is just empiricism. I have to do it from the evidence. So I can't just make shit up. Because, right. And so um, the commonality is evidence from application of many fields in many areas. Well, commonality across time is really powerful because it, sh it shows that it's true not only geographically, but across time and different levels of knowledge and circumstance. So, I mean, the commonality says that this is the reason the first principle explains why, and I can outlaw it. So what, this is like why I say to people, you know, people don't understand the law. Well, I would say there's two things. There's understanding the law. There's understanding the Constitution, which is the natural law. There's understanding the Constitution. There's understanding the, the codes that we have. There's understanding local codes we have. <laughs> there's a history of judgments. in the. I mean, there's a lot of here to understand. And the courts just made a profound ruling. Right? I mean, it's more profound than you'd think, which is there has to be historical case and precedent for you to claim something. Uh, especially in the Second Amendment, is what they're working on, and so the court's gone back to it has to it has to be it has to be from evidence, not from theory. So and so it has to, it has to have a prior circumstance. We have to have demonstrated it in history as applicable. We can't just make up new stuff out of that because we want to, unless it goes through the Constitution. So that's how I look at it. But the people need to understand the law. No, they don't. Most people. No, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to um, Lindsay's <laughs> Lindsay's framing of this problem. He's framed it in in a manner that is historically precedented and and reverberant in in, in its understanding because he's talking about it in a philosophical religious framework. And he says this this it stems from the Middle East, and it is hermeneutic is in its function. And that's the that is the issue that he's talking about. And it's like it it achieves the same objective in first causes in my understanding of it. No. 
I, I, I told you yesterday why I could spend agnostics having the opposite objective. So it's not a first principle. It's just a it's just a narrative structure that satisfies the demand. Whereas mm. I can make the argument that Gnostics were right. And that they were trying to prevent what was going wrong, what the what the rest of the Christians were doing wrong. So it's not a first principle. It's just a, it's just an arbitrary discretion. And so the second thing is it has no basis and right. it has no scientific basis. It doesn't, it's not, it's just a sort of it's just a story. Now, uh, let's say that it, so it's a story that's an analogy. Stories and analogy are great for uh, for understanding, but they're not useful for adjudication. So I have to be able to find, I have to be able to find something that isn't isn't uh, interpretable from many different directions, but that's right. decidable. So I mean, like I said, you know, it's one thing to. I mean, again, and I think this is a common thing you and I both are aware of is that, you know, you think about it, how do we persuade people and, and convince people? And I think of how to adjudicate, adjudicate the law, regardless of what people think, mm. you know, and, and so I work, that's why I say, I mean, what do I fundamentally do? I, you know, I, I'm an epistemologist. I work on decidability, decidability appeared to, applied to law. And you know, I, I I just find look for what's decidable. Whether you agree with it or understand it is irrelevant because decidable is decidable regardless of whether you agree and understand it. it doesn't make any fucking difference what you think. Right. The problem is that how do you get in a position where you put you put decidability in place instead of arbitrary discretions? How do you make rule of law continue on its journey uh, to purely purely scientific purely scientific? How about, uh, how, about how about get rule of law off the curb where it's broke down and busted up and get it back on the road again. Well, people had, people had fanciful ideas. I mean, American jurisprudence in the 19th century is a, is a philosophical movement and we're, we're somewhat stuck with it still. Um, and so it's called classical pragmatism. And to some degree we're sort of there, which, which is, is a, a sort of, belief that uh we can use government to manage positively more mm -hmm. so than government in other words government in the past was largely defense right right a defensive right it wasn't terribly proactive that was the church's job is to convince you uh for through persuasion to be moral but the job the government's job wasn't um the uh the other thing the government tended to do was award artists and beauty and whatever so they're it's very high level stuff but the church did most of the education so our government got into this american pragmatism stuff which is dewey and these fucking assholes i mean so you mm. know so you know and then you get the progressives out of that which are the next more optimistic side and then at the same time in europe we're getting the marxist spread so we have american pragmatism and progressivism leading into the beginning of the century. And we have in Europe, we have the, the Marxists. And the difference is, is that the, in America, we felt we were in control of our destiny. And the Marxists in Europe, the vast amount of the population was trying to still escape from the, the nobility. And so they felt less in control of their destiny. So it's logical. So this work, so we had this workers revolt in in the European places building up just at the same time American pragmatism. And these two things came together, this underclass out of control and this upper middle class in control uh, dynamic hit together and we come out of the world wars and we now the world wars are largely the process of converting from empires to federations in the Anglo sense. And uh, we've destroyed, and so the America comes out of it's trying to concretize that as free trade instead of empires, right? Because empires basically control trade and trade routes and colonies and resources. So they don't have to engage in free trade. But the American model was to make everybody engage in free trade so that, and this would make it so that we didn't have empires that had to fight wars and that we would have essentially free trade with everybody. And this would especially benefit the small countries who were victims of the empires. So that's been the American post-war content. So I mean, all, all this stuff is going on. It makes perfect sense but then you've got the post-war uh combination of females 
women vote women voters, um, women in the workplace. You get the pill. You get the Jewish movement of Marxists from from Europe over into America as from from class Marxist using class to disrupt the power structure to using race to disrupt the power structure and undermine the civilization. And so you get this, what we're at now, which is the confluence of what's left of American pragmatism, what's left of uh, American uh, progressivism, what's left of um, Marxist race Marxism and um, uh, a missing one. And what's left of traditional uh, European aristocratic uh, values, and so you have this confluence of this conflict, and we're sort of trying to sort out the these three things. And you know, I can look at this and say, well, uh, the the progressive one was a false promise, the Marxist one was a false promise, um, the feminism one is a false promise, and the only one that's not a false promise is natural natural law, the aristocracy, who basically virtue signals by being the most moral governors. So uh, you have this natural thing going on, which I, I completely understand, but it's also because just be, simply because it's a complexity that was made possible by the industrial revolution. We're continuing the transition from agrarian empires to industrial federations is what I see. <clears throat> Like it's obvious why there would be some kerfuffle here, because there's kerfuffle whenever there's anything this big happen. Now we're still working through the industrial revolution, so I mean everybody's going to try to take advantage of this new opportunity called prosperity from industry to bring about their fantasies. But the answer is there's only one fantasy to bring about, and that's natural law. Rule of law. That works. How about that? Is that a good ending place? I think it's a good ending place, sure. But well, well, introduce the awesome. episode, even at the end. Please, everybody, leave like and subscribe and notification bells and leave some messages for us. We like to read them. All right. Love it, man. Check the Institute website for a place to donate. There you go. Thank now, you, let's chat a little bit after this, Kurt. Okay. Did I frustrate you too much today? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.